Hello, chart watchers, and welcome to this Thursday, September 20th Market Watchers Live show with your host, Tom Boley and Aaron Swenlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Well, it's a record setting day right now on Wall Street. The uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average currently at 26,661. This is above the highest close in history at 26,617. So we are on the verge of a historic day for the Dow Jones. We'll have to see whether or not we hold it into the close. The S&P 500 up 22 points to 2930, breaking out to another all-time high close. The NASDAQ and the Russell 2000, though, definitely struggling on a relative basis. The NASDAQ having a good day, up 71 points, but still uh, roughly 100 points beneath where we saw just a few weeks ago. And the Russell 2000 actually been in a downtrend for the most part this month, while the S&P has been going higher. But the Russell is up today about 10 points to 1713. Ten-year Treasury yield nearly touched 3.10% today, but has backed off and currently down two basis points to 306. Volatility index continues to decline. This is good news for the bulls. Anytime you see a VIX reading down that 10, 11, 12 range, you're pretty well assured that you are in a bull market. Uh, the XLK technology ETF outperforming today, performing really well in the software space. We'll talk about that in a bit. But uh, technology uh, up uh, over 1% today. Materials doing the same thing. You can see consumer staples, a defensive group, trying to make a big breakout over the past couple of months' highs. And uh, healthcare continues to travel higher as well, up uh, about 0.8% today. Despite the strength in software stocks leading technology, you can see Red Hat uh, came out with their earnings report. I'll talk about the numbers here in just a couple minutes. But uh, the market didn't like it. Red Hat down about $9 today. And then finally, the uh, cannabis stock's been in the news this week, and many of them have settled down today, but New Age Beverage has not settled down. The stock up another 54% today, and uh, this was a $1.60 stock at the beginning of the week and went over $7 today, so a lot of hype in many of these stocks. Okay, Aaron, Thursday morning, market at new record highs. It just doesn't seem to be an end in sight, and this has taken place during – what normally is a bearish period in the market. So interesting indeed. Oh, quite interesting, I have to say. I, you know, I was doing my DP alert last night and I was looking at all my indicators. And, you know, right now I see another day maybe of this, but I just keep thinking we're going to get a bit of a pullback here or at least some consolidation. Uh, you know, the indicators are getting a little bit stretched and. Yeah, I don't know. The short term's not looking as good, but I have to say, I think the intermediate term is still very strong picture. Yeah, there's definitely some uh, weird stuff going on in the market, uh, just in on, on an interrelationship basis. I know, you know, Treasury yields here in the U.S. are rising faster than overseas, and yet the dollar is not following suit to the upside. We're actually starting to diverge a little bit there again. But with the dollar falling, gold's not really getting that much of a boost. So it's really been uh, kind of a crazy uh, yeah, I just, I can't, I don't get gold. I mean, it is in the best setup it's been in in so long. Greg Schnell was, you know, talking about it a couple of weeks ago and it just hasn't done anything. It's the environment's ready. There's bearish sentiment there. I, I just, I'm not sure what's going on with gold, but I'm expecting it to still pick up here soon. I, I don't know. Well, if we've got questions, we got a special guest that's got answers. Julius DeCampinar is with us today. How are you doing, Julius? Hey, I'm good. No pressure. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I'm good. Uh, looking forward to uh, come back with you guys uh, a little bit later. Uh, the plan is to um, have a look at some asset and sector uh, rotation and as well do a very quick revisit of the turtle soup strategy that we talked about a couple of months ago and show you how you can use the alert function on the site to uh, have those tickers in your inbox every morning. All right. I know you're going to get into uh, to a lot of things later, but I do have a question for you with the S&P and the Dow breaking out the all-time highs. Does it matter for you as far as rotation, who, where the money is going? In other words, are, are some areas more bullish than others, do you think? Or do you don't, or you don't care? You're just looking to see where that money's going. 
Well, both, I'd say. I mean, I look where the money is going and relative rotation graphs will show you where the money is going, no matter what the market is doing. I mean, if the market's going up, that's all good. Um, and you will see which sectors are very strong. But also when the market is going down, uh, relative rotation graphs will show you where to hide. Where, so where the market is going down less fast. So, yeah, I'm, I'm doing uh, both things, I guess. Um, uh, and, and yes, it does matter. I mean, I've, I've talked a lot about how you could use the sector rotation model, including uh, in combination with relative rotation graphs to get a handle on the big picture for the market as a whole on sector rotation. Okay, cool. Well, I, it seems weird to me the way the market's set up today with, with the uh, technology group leading and software doing well, but then the NASDAQ underperforming the, the S&P and the Dow. Uh, the whole thing just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But uh, I mean, it's not crazy. It's not like something's terribly wrong with the market. It just seems a little odd to me that we would be seeing some of the other aggressive areas of the market not participating. But we can talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we're going to have sure you do. Back. Yeah, we'll have you back in about 15 minutes or so. So hang in there with us, Julius. Not going anywhere. All right. Uh, Aaron, we got a bunch to go over. Why don't we get started? Absolutely. The schedule is looking pretty good for next week. Uh, tomorrow, though, we do have Mary Ellen coming in. Uh, you have a workshop on Tuesday. Oh, our friend Tom McClellan will be back on Wednesday. And then you'll be doing your monthly seasonality report next at the end of next week. So that should all be good. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yep. And today's agenda, as Julia said, he'll be talking RRG, uh, asset and sector rotation. 10 and 10 to 1. Our first stock will be Bank of America. A lot of interest in financials lately. And Anatomy of a Trade will finish off. And Julius has graciously decided to join us for Anatomy of a Trade. So that should be very interesting. So let's get started. Uh, we want to get it moving. Technical news and headlines, Tom. Yeah, there's uh, quite a bit of news that was out this morning. So let's take a look first at the 10-year uh, Treasury yield. You can see we did get up close to that May high. And remember, that's the highest level, not just on this chart over six months, but that's the highest level we've seen since 2011. So that's a big number, uh, a big yield resistance area to get through. I'm not surprised that as we got close to that 310 that we saw a little bit of movement back to the downside. I think money, you know, rotating a little bit more back towards the uh, treasury market. Uh, this is just where you would expect that uh, maybe you would see some buying of treasuries, which would then bring the yield down. Because as the 10-year treasury yield hits resistance, many times you're seeing the uh, treasury prices hitting support. So you would expect a bounce in treasuries and maybe a short-term pullback. But there's no denying we have been in a big move up in terms of the Treasury yield, and that pretends economic strength ahead. And some of that was underscored this morning. Initial jobless claims came in at 201,000, market looking for 210,000. So uh, good news on the initial jobless claims front. Then uh, also at 8.30 this morning, September Philadelphia Fed survey, 22.9. The market was expecting 19.6. But that 22.9 reading almost doubled the 11.9 reading we had for August. So you can definitely see the economic strength picking up. Uh, August existing home sales, though, did come in just slightly below expectations. 5,340,000 units versus 5,360,000 units expected. And then finally, at uh, 10 a.m., August leading indicators rose 0.4%, market expecting 0.5%. So all in all... I think this move higher in the 10-year Treasury yield certainly appears to be justified based on a lot of the economic news that is out. And then also keep in mind the market looks forward and the stock market is a leading economic indicator. And when we see the Dow Jones and the S&P 500 breaking to all-time highs, recently we saw the same thing with the NASDAQ and the Russell 2000. That's an indication that the market is looking forward and liking what it sees in terms of the corporate profits. And that is generally a good sign about economic strength as we look ahead. So the treasury market is telling us simply what the equity markets are telling us, that it looks like fourth quarter is going to be a strong quarter. And I would not be surprised to see the bull market rage on into the fourth quarter and into 2019. Uh, taking a look at a couple of areas, let's pull up that S&P 500 chart first and let's uh, see um, that breakout. Uh, here you can see beautiful gap up and continuing to move higher from the open. This isn't just a, a gap up. We're continuing to trade higher. And if we go and take a look at an intraday chart, 10 minute chart, you can see we gapped up here above the 2917 
all-time high, uh, opening at 29.20 roughly, and we have just continued powering forward. So a trend day, and what I refer to as a trend day, is where you simply move in the same direction all day long. You gap up and it just never stops. You just keep going. These tend to be very bullish kinds of days. And I know it's, uh, you know, this time of September typically isn't very strong, but I always view technicals to be more important than historical or seasonal data. And when the market says it's breaking out, I don't think the uh, seasonal headwinds necessarily are going to be uh, strong enough to stop it. So we got to break out. I think that's the way you have to trade this market right now, continuing uh, to be on the long side and waiting to see whether or not, uh, you know, at some point we will get a pullback. But the question is, where uh, will we top before we get that pullback and how long will it last? Uh, that's anyone's guess at this point. The, the point here is that we are in breakout uh, mode and I would not bet against the stock market when you're breaking out in a bull market. Uh, let's take a look at a couple of one other chart first. The S&P 500, by the way, when we look at it, we see the breakout here on this chart. Look at all the other global markets, though. Here's the German DAX. Here we are looking at the China, Shanghai. Uh, then we got the Hang Seng, the Nikkei, and then we got the Bombay. I mean, none of these, except for maybe the Bombay, which uh, set a high in late August, none of these uh, really have uh, shown a lot of strength. The Nikkei definitely has picked up, and we're getting close to that high we saw back in January. But many of the other indices continue to waffle lower. And I think what the market is telling us and what the what global traders are telling us is that all of the trade fears that are out there apply more toward the other global markets than they do toward the U.S. markets. I think the uh, traders are betting that the U.S. is going to come out the winner in these uh, trade discussions, and at least that's the way the market is trading. Uh, that, so that's the way I would look at it. Now, as far as the I mentioned earlier, I'm a little concerned about the dollar not participating with the direction of the Treasury yields here in the U.S. relative to Germany. Here you can see we just broke out to another high. Our Treasury yield here in the U.S. versus the German Treasury yield has just broken out to another high. And normally what we see is a lot of positive correlation between the direction of our yields versus Germany and the direction of the U.S. dollar. The dollar, as long as our rates are going up faster than other countries, it means that our economy, at least in theory, our economy is strengthening faster. And that should lead to a stronger dollar. And for the most part, that's what we see. But you can see over the past I don't know, one, two months, we've broken out to another high, and yet the dollar has been rolling over. And yet, as we mentioned earlier, that has not uh, really, uh, um, and I want to pull up the UUP and just show you what's going on today. The dollar, you can see trading down at about a seven-week low, low, but that has not translated into a breakout in gold. As gold continues to meander, it's only up a nickel today with the dollar breaking down. And you can see it's been a struggle for the GLD to get above 115. So technically, if you're watching gold, I would wait and see this breakout above 115 before I would get overly excited. I think what could be happening here is that traders in gold don't believe the dollar is going to remain low. And if the dollar starts to strengthen again, obviously, that would put pressure on gold. A couple of quick stocks in that uh, cannabis space that have been on fire. You can see Tilray pulling back quite a bit today. Of course, who knows where it'll be by the end of the day. The, uh, vo the volatility here has just been crazy. And then uh, NBEV, I mentioned this one yesterday. I mentioned it in my blog as well. Stock is now back over $7. It's up 63% today. New Age Beverages Corp, NBEV. They use a compound in the cannabis plant, CBD. Uh, they're, they're working on a, a line of beverages that are infused with this CBD. And so clearly, and there's a show coming up in Las Vegas, I think, in about two weeks. And they're going to be presenting a lot of hype around this stock, as well as Tilray and many of the others. Uh, but we got a bunch to go over here. Uh, Aaron, I know you've got a number of upgrades, downgrades. So what do those look like? All right, let's get started on those. We have quite a few indeed. Uh, I wanted to start off with the upgrades. And I'm going to look at AMD first. Oh, don't want to look at it that way. There we go. Uh, I, I switched into some six month charts, so I, just for, for grins here to try it out. Uh, so anyway, what I'm noticing, of course, is that we're right back down. We pulled down to $30. AMD was, uh, Stifle Nicholas basically said that they're going to maintain a buy on AMD. And, you know, I would be a little worried. You know, we did have this 
um, stoppage, a little bit of uh, pullback, and that has caused the PMO to top. Uh, I wouldn't be adding to any of positions. I would say based on the fact that we're looking at possible slowing and momentum, I'd probably be watching this uh, 28 to 30 dollar range. You know, if we're start going to start to get back down there uh, to that 20, it could be an opportunity to get back in. Uh, but at the same time, it would cancel out what looks like a really nice flag that's been trying to develop here. So, you know, mixed feelings right now for me about AMD. It has been the stronger performer as far as uh, its peers. But uh, hey, hey, Aaron, mm -hmm. I, I thought what was also interesting on that particular stock, AMD, that uh, Stifo, I think, raised their target from 21 to $38. It's kind of funny when you think about it. It's got a target of 21 on it. The stock's been trading in the <laughs> low 30s. That's a pretty easy raising of the target, don't you think? I would think so, yes. Uh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Caterpillar here, if I can get back to that. All right. Caterpillar was also upgraded. Robert Baird from a neutral to an outperform. Boy, I don't know what's going on here. I can't get to things. Let's try it this way. You can still hear me and everything. I didn't drop off. It's Oh, we got you. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what's going on here. Let's try it over in Safari, see what we get. All right, there we go. Okay, so as I was saying, Caterpillar was upgraded to from a neutral to an outperform. Uh, obviously doing quite well on the upgrade, but it was already in really a parabolic rally going on here. But I, I wouldn't get overly concerned about that parabola uh, that does appear to be forming. I still really like this PMO and that PMO is not overbought. So despite having this uh, sort of parabolic look, you know, the PMO is still telling us that we've got some room to run. Uh, I would just be a little careful because if it did break down this parabola, normally they go down to where they're they're basing uh, previously, and that would of course bring you down into that 140, 145 area. So, you know, be a little bit cautious there if it were to get below that 145. But it did get upgraded, and so far it's looking pretty good. The other one we had was Rig, and this was actually upgraded yesterday. And uh, today it was upgraded by RBC from a sector perform to an outperform. I love this stock. I bought this stock. I will be talking about this stock in Anatomy of a Trade. And uh, I talked about, it, I think, yesterday as well. Uh, really nice double bottom set up here. We had just barely triggered the double bottom with that, that intraday move just above the confirmation line. Well, today we got the execution. So the pattern's now confirmed. You should be looking for a move about the size of the pattern, and that's a $2 move. Uh, so I, I'm pretty excited about it. I, I do like it. Um, and like I said, I'll talk to you more about it in Anatomy of a Trade. Our other upgrade was uh, Ralph Lauren RL here. Piper Jaffrey uh, upgraded from underweight to neutral. So, you know, I, it's setting up nicely because you do have a PMO that has pulled back uh, during an area of mostly consolidation, if you want to look at this trading range. And it's starting to finally turn back up, but we did get faked out earlier on the PMO turning up, but it's turned up just above that zero line. And we do have a pretty nice looking scooter here, uh, break out above this short term uh, overhead resistance uh, from uh, looks like about a week and a half ago. I think this one has room to run. I think it could certainly get up in here to, to test uh, some of these uh, tops that we've seen previously. So I think Ralph Lauren looks pretty good on the upgrade. I just am kind of, uh, you know, I've, I've owned Guest. I finally sold it. It's just this uh, retail apparel. I just haven't seen a whole lot of action there. So I'd just be uh, cautious. I wouldn't expect a really quick run to the upside. All right, downgrades. We have Bank of America downgrading Fortinet from an overweight to a neutral. You know, it was already moving its way down. The PMO had already told us there were some problems here. Uh, and it's, that sell signal is very clean. There's not a lot of uh, hesitation. And it's very overbought. I would expect this one to come all the way down here to, well, certainly to that 50-day EMA. But I could see certainly it coming down to maybe even uh, test that gap support. So I don't think Fortinet looks too good right now. Uh, Stitch Fix, 
And this one was downgraded from overweight to neutral. Uh, it took a real a big dive uh, yesterday, and you know, so not surprising to see this uh, neutral move from uh, you know overweight to neutral. Do have the PMO is topped. Uh, I love the company in terms of using it, um, but I've noticed their business model does seem to be getting a little bit strange. And um, I mean, I could talk about that more, but we don't have a whole lot of time. But I, I do have some concerns here about Stitch Fix and that PMO I think tells the story. And finally, uh, Skechers was downgraded by Cowan and company from market outperform to a market perform and uh, nothing good on this chart. So I can certainly see why we would downgrade it. Um, I don't even see it performing. <laughs> if it's moved to a market perform, I wouldn't be looking for much, you know, two, uh, you know, uh, hesitations here on the PMO and a top below the, the signal line, not liking it. I just don't see anything really great here. Uh, I'd look for a test of support at $24. Maybe it might get interesting then because that is some longer term support. That's all I have for the upgrades and downgrades. Julius, I'm ready to bring you in. Very good. Let me grab the screen real quickly. Oh. Absolutely. And take your time. No worries on time. Everybody yeah, while you're doing this. They always have <laughs> more time. You always have enough time. Here we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Um, okay, guys. Um, I want to do a really quick revisit of the turtle soup setup that we talked about a couple of months ago. Um, and I've shared the code for that in a blog. Let me very quickly, it's, uh, by the way, this is coming from the um, a very popular book. It's 1996, old, but still very good. Uh, it's called Street Smarts, which was written by Larry Connors and Linda Bradford Rashke, very well-known names in the industry. Um, and the short version of this strategy that is, is actually looking to trade on false breakouts, um, which is, and that's where, where, that's where the name is coming from. It's a bit of a uh, wink to the turtle trading strategy, which is actually a, a breakout strategy, as we all know. The rules for a setup, because that's what we're looking for, we're looking for setups, is that the market or the stock that we're looking must make a new 20 lay low today. And the lower, the better, because we're looking for bounces and, and rebuttals. Um, the previous 20-day low must have occurred at least four trading sessions earlier, and this is very important. So we're looking for a market that has come down, set a 20-day low, then bounced a minimum of four trading sessions, and then is revisiting that 20-day low. And we're looking for the bounce of that 20-day low to get in. So if the market falls below that prior 20-day low, then we're going to place a buy stop. And the text says 5 to 10 ticks because it was originally used in the futures markets where we had ticks and not really cents um, above the previous 20-day low. And that entry stop is good for today only. Um, I'd say you can use a little bit of discretion and liberty in the 5 to 10 ticks, depending on the price of the stock that you're trading. Um, I think, you know, use your common sense to, uh, to put that entry stop in. But what you're looking for is a, um, a break below that low, and then all of a sudden the market reverses and comes back to it. And when it comes back, that's when we want to get in. Um, of course, we need a, um, uh, a sell stop. So if our buy stop is filled, we are immediately going to place a good to canceled sell stop uh, right below today's low. So we're going to have a, a very short stop. So uh, if it goes wrong, we'll be out very quickly with a very small loss. And if the position becomes profitable, we're going to use a trailing stop to protect our gain. And that's with this strategy. It only gives you a setup. It doesn't give you an exact exit strategy. Um, that is where a little bit of your own creativity and trading style comes in. But clearly, they want you to use a trailing stop. And I agree with that. It's a, it's a swing trade. It's a bounce trade. It's not going to be forever. Um, so you want to get in. Against the low, you have a short stop and ride the ride the uh, the rally that comes out of that low. 
Now there's one re-entry rule. So if you're stopped out on day one or two of the trade, then you can enter a, a re-enter a buy stop at the original entry level, but that's only for day one or day two. So if we're looking at today, that will be today or tomorrow that you can come back to that. Now, let me go to my, yes, this is what I'm looking for. Um, you can read more on this strategy in the blog that I wrote back in June. Um, it actually has the code to scan for the setups. If you scroll down, you will see the scan code. Um, and this code will look for a market that hasn't made a 20 day low and is now minimum of four days later. And we're looking for a test of that low. And there are two lines at the bottom that you need to pay attention to. Um, uh, the one here is commented out, as you can see. So if you run it with this line uncommented, what you're actually looking for is stocks that are very close to their 20 day low and are potentially ready for a turtle sub setup. You can see here this 1.01 means that we're looking for stocks that are within 1% of that 20 day low. Now, if the market is open as it is right now, we could comment this line out and uncomment the last line. And if we would run it, then we are running uh, a scan for stocks that have set a 20 day low today. And that is what I wanted to show you because I've got this prepared. So here is the code. And we're going to run this for the last intraday update here. And we're going to run the scan and see what's happening. So here we now have 10 stocks that are today making a new 20 day low. And what I do here is I replace an existing chart list. And I have a list here that is, where is it? Turtle soup buy. And I say, okay. So my list is now created. And we can then very quickly go to it. I have a special setup for this. It's a, what I call a six month daily bar. And boom, here you see it. This is already happening. AWK. Today, here was the 20 day low, 87.01. Today we got below it, it's not very far, but you see that's a very nice entry already. I need to apply this style to all in my chart list. And then we can actually browse through the various stocks. There's another one here, testing that 20 day low and bouncing above it. You see that yesterday we just stopped short. It was 48.62 and we're 48.59. And today the low was 48.45. So, you know, at 48.45, we would have the entry probably somewhere 48.60, something like that. So we'd be in the trade. I'll be managing the trade going higher right now. And uh, the next stock in the list. This is actually, this is the stuff that you're looking for. Here you see the market dropping. It drops to a low today of 69.23, which is well below the 69.61 that we had here. And it rallied above it, stopping you into the trade. And you now belong this stock Dominion Energy with a stop loss, let's say 69.15 or 69.10, depending on how much leeway you want to give the trade managing your um, uh, trade upwards. I'm um, not sure how many there were, was like 10 stocks in there, but I'll, I'll quickly browse through them. You'll see that they're all testing these lows and rallying back, back above it. Um, the other thing, I, I think you get the idea now. The, the other thing that I have set up for myself, and which is really a very useful um, feature of the stock chart site, is that you can actually have the alert, you can use the alert function for this scan, and you can have it mailed to yourself overnight. Now, what you need to do, obviously, you need to set it to the last market close, um, because the scan will run overnight. And what the site will then do, it will actually send you a mail. 
here you got it. I've got these, these are collected into a separate mailbox for me. And if I open that, you will get a mail every day with the names that have triggered a potential turtle soup setup. And I think it's a very easy way uh, for me to start the day with a couple of names to work from and that are, you know, potential short-term bounces to start into your workflow. I try to throw them at an RRG and see if I can mix the trend following aspects of an RRG and the reversal type uh, moves that I expect from, uh, from a turtle soup uh, strategy. So hopefully you have got some takeaways uh, from this uh, setup, the turtle soup to start with, and then using the, uh, the scanning engine and the alerts to have this delivered to your inbox on a daily basis. Um, and as a side effect, what you can see is the more of those tickers that come into your mailbox, um, you have a little bit of a market bouncing. So very recently with the market coming down, um, the number of tickers in that mail, in that mail started to grow. Uh, and if we start to go up, and you know, as Tom and Aaron mentioned earlier, it seems as if we're going uh, to go higher again with, with all-time highs for the Dow and the S&P, um, I would expect these um, a number of tickers to, to decrease. Uh, and sometimes there will just be no tickers at all. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a second handle that you can get on the market as a whole. Okay, um, a quick rundown of the market rotations according to, uh, to RRGs. Um, I want to start off with the RRG for asset allocation. And uh, there is, unless if, if you have not found it already, there is a pre-populated group for asset allocation in the drop-down box on the RRG page. And what this shows you real quickly is the rotation of a number of ETFs that track various asset classes um, to give you the big picture of what's going on. And what stands out to me on this picture is the fact that equities or the S&P 500 SPY is A, the only asset class in the leading quadrant, and um, uh, B, it is still gaining at both axes. So um, that's a very strong sign. And I, I offset that against IEF, which is the um, ticker for government bonds, and they're almost moving uh, opposite. So um, this, to me, is a very clear signal that this is a risk on market. They are very clear uh, that equities are outperforming and bonds are underperforming. So the question whether you should invest in equities or in bonds actually is very clearly defined here. You should prefer equities still. Now, as to the other asset classes that we see, we see um, LQD, which is corporate bonds, uh, moving lower a little bit. High yield, a little bit better than the other two fixed income asset classes, but still clearly to the left. We see V&Q, which is real estate, uh, rotating through weakening. It's still good, but it's rapidly losing um, relative momentum, which makes me a little bit uh, worrisome about the performance, potential performance of this asset class. What I'd be looking for here is a turnaround inside weakening and going back up if that's going to happen anytime soon. For now, I'd be, I'd be a little bit careful with that. And the one on the left, very, very far away is commodities. And that is, you know, despite the fact that it's moving higher on the RS momentum axis, it is still a, um, uh, a very weak asset classes and I would avoid it in my portfolio. Okay, if we move over to uh, the equity side of things, then we have the RRG showing the various sectors here. And I'm going to split my screen, make this the left, and this one goes to the right. So we can work side by side on this. That always works pretty nicely. Um, and you can see that I have quickly annotated those charts. These are all 10 sector charts. And we have the material sector here. It, it came out of that uptrend, worked its way into a symmetrical triangle. It's coming out of it right now, which is a positive. So from a price perspective, you would expect uh, materials to move a little bit higher. But what you see is that there is quite a bit of overhead resistance waiting um, at the previous high. 
as well as the previous support line that I think is going to cap the upward potential. And if you look at the relative performance, you see that it has broken an important horizontal level. It's moving up a little bit, but here also uh, the relative potential to me seems to be capped around this horizontal line. And you'll see that both RRG lines are below the 100 level positioning um, uh, materials inside the lagging quadrant. And it's right here, um, moving a little bit higher, but far away to the left. As a matter of fact, if you measure it on the RS ratio scale, it is the weakest sector in the universe. Uh, so despite the improvement in price, um, it would not make a um, place to the um, uh, to the portfolio for me. Um, the second one here is energy. That is a sector that is coming down uh, all the way here, very long tail, still weakening. And uh, it has a lot of overhead resistance on the price chart, which makes me worrisome that, you know, you need a lot of price action to break higher. Uh, if you look at the relative line, that has a lot of overhead resistance uh, waiting for it. The RRG lines are rolling over. So for me, this is a uh, this is a weak sector, an underperforming sector, and it's actually following through quite well uh, on the blog that I wrote a couple of weeks ago on the uh, move out of staples into energy. And we'll get to staples a little bit later on. If we look at financials, um, that came out of a what looks like to be a falling wedge, which is a positive thing. It's working its way higher, but you can see that is it's having trouble for weeks already with that old support line that's now acting as resistance. Um, and, and again, there will be also resistance coming off that previous high. What I do like about this is the fact that we're working our way on support in the relative strength line here the second time already and we look to be bouncing higher we see that the rg lines are curling upward which makes it quite positive and if this improvement in price can continue and you know it's it's pushing against that resistance already for quite a while if we can make it higher and if, especially if we can break through that previous high, then this could be a very interesting uh, sector, especially if we stay above the support level. There's a lot of room upside on a relative uh, basis as well as on a price basis. And we see that financials here is inside the improving quadrant uh, and it could follow through um, very rapidly. So uh, especially for the short term, there is a little bit to expect uh, from here. So you see that the curling higher, expect an outperformance. Um, and I hope that that shorter term will be able to pull this into a longer term move all the way into, into the leading uh, quadrant. Industrials, insight improving, nice long tail, just like financial. That means that there is power behind the move. Um, this looks good and it's now, it, it needs to break beyond that old high. If that happens, then I think Going back into that range is a no-brainer. That will happen. The RRG lines seem to be uh, taking a little bit of a um, uh, heads up uh, on that for that to happen. So this, for me, is a strong chart. I am sort of betting that this will improve further. Uh, I am going with the RS momentum and the low that we've seen in the RS ratio and the fact that we have the sector moving up on both axes in the RRG heading towards leading. So definitely for the short term, I expect a little bit of improvement for uh, for the industrial sector. And we'll have to, to wait and see whether it can make it all the way to leading. But for now, things are looking pretty good for, uh, for industrials. Technology is a sector that everybody's looking at. Um, the price chart is, is a no-brainer. That's still very strong. It's going all the way up, higher highs, higher lows. Uh, no problem whatsoever there. Um, on the relative front, it, it looks very good, but it's approaching its support line and it hasn't done a lot over the last few weeks. And that translates itself into a uh, falling RS ratio and an RS momentum that's below 100, which positions the technology sector inside the improving, uh, sorry, the weakening quadrant. Let me highlight that for you so that you can see it. And it's, it's moving sideways. Uh, the tail is not too long. Um, so there is still a good opportunity for this to curl up, to curl back up and move to leading without crossing over into uh, into the lagging quadrant. But then things need to change rapidly for relative strength. So I'll be eyeing the XLK uh, ETF, the, the technology sector, 
um, for a break in relative strength anytime soon uh, to, to pull the market higher because it is still one of the most important uh, sectors of the S&P 500. Moving on to uh, staples. This is the one that kept the market up uh, during a, a little bit of a doldrum uh, period. Uh, it was very strong not too long ago when it moved very strongly through improving. And now you see that it is rolling over. Uh, it's still heading towards the 100 level, but I really doubt whether it's going to make it. And, and if we go into the leading quadrant, it's not at a very good angle and it's not a very strong sector anymore. So it's lost its, uh, its, uh, its mojo uh, and it's running into resistance on that old support line, which it looks to be too heavy right now. And the same goes for that resistance line coming down over the highs in the in the ratio chart is just a little bit too much. And I'm afraid that Staples will need another rotation on the left-hand side. Hey, if you translate Staples as defensive and Staples being on the left-hand side, that means a positive sign for the market as a whole. And I think that's, that's what we like more than an outperformance uh, for Staples. Quickly moving to real estate. Um, very, very long tail inside weakening there you are uh i don't see a lot of positives here uh for the short term especially not from a relative point of view so i'll avoid this uh, i i think it's going to be underperforming uh, unless things change very very rapidly but i i, I don't see it uh, at the moment um and then we have utilities which is another defensive and not doing very well. It's coming out of leading into weakening. And you see that it's very close to crossing over. You know, this is a very low RS ratio level. The heading is negative, so it's losing on both axes. And you see that back in the uh, in the RS line, which is kept caught between, you know, the upper and the lower boundary of that trading range. RG lines very close to 100, positioning very close to the benchmark. As you all know, that means that that is very difficult to read. It's moving in line with the benchmark. This is heading negatively. Um, I think this overhead resistance will be too strong for now. For me, that's an underperforming. And then finally, we have uh, healthcare, one of the last. This is a really nice uh, chart. It's breaking out to new highs on the price chart. And Look at this relative line. This is this has been working its way higher. It it bounced off support. It's moving its way higher to this double resistance level, if you may call it like that. I'm watching this very closely because once this is starting to move higher, clearing that overhead resistance, it's positioned well inside the leading quadrant uh, and with a very strong breakout in price. This could be the sector that will lead us higher over the next few months. Uh, potentially together with financials and industrials. Um, finally, the discretionary sector, very, very strong, very recently, lost a little bit of relative momentum. I mean, this is still doing well, but it's losing a little bit of relative strength there. If we highlight it in the RRG, we're here. It's a little bit in the same camp as where we had technology. Uh, it had a very strong rotation through leading. It's now inside weakening. Um, it's definitely a risk on sector where you expect people to go to when they expect more growth and the market to go higher. The price chart's looking very good, but I do like to see relative strength push above its previous high um, in order to turn X or Y back up inside that weakening quadrant, and then it'll join the ranks of... Um, uh, healthcare, financials, and industrials, and potentially technology if it turns around as well. Um, I think we're, well, that's pretty good, 25 minutes, no problem at all. So we had a, um, a quick rundown of your asset rotation and your sector rotation. I'll be around if there are any more specific questions, um, and I'll be there for the uh, anatomy of a trade uh, later on. So, Tom, unless you want me to do anything else. Well, I got a question for you. Well, there you go. <laughs> Um, one question you, you mentioned earlier, and I think it was on the XLP, where it was in the improving quadrant, but it was turning lower. Yes. And also the XLE was in the weakening quadrant, and it also was turning lower as it crossed that, uh, that um, vertical line and went into the lagging. Yeah. And so is it 
true then that as you're crossing that vertical line, you want to be increasing as opposed to, you know, you want the lines to be going up in both situations as opposed to going down? Um, what you would like to see, for example, if we look at um, XLP here, which I've highlighted, what you ideally would like to see for it to be strong is when we would cross over the 100 level on the RS ratio line, which is this vertical line that you're referring to. I would love to see that with a what we call a strong RRG heading, which means uh, between zero and 90 degrees. So it's ang it will be angling upward. Because right now, if, if, you, if you go into leading, you're going into leading, but at a, a weak relative momentum. So you're, you're going into it and you immediately start moving out of it. And for the energy um, sector here, you see that when this moved out of weakening, so here, you see that it's, it's, it's moving from weakening to lagging at a negative RRG heading. So it's losing, it's losing strength on the RS ratio and it's losing strength on the RS momentum. So this, I, I would comfortably call a weaker sector because it's firing on both, on both axes and going lower, calling it an underperformance. If we would see a sector moving from weakening to lagging at a, at a heading that is already gaining on the momentum axis, uh, it wouldn't be too negative for me. It's still negative, but I wouldn't be too concerned because it's already improving again. Um, it's it's a balancing act, uh, I have to say. It's a little bit judgmental. Uh, the left side is good. If you want to make it very, very uh, binary, so to say, then the left side is good and the right side is bad. But the fact that RRG gives you a lot more information, you can use it to your benefit and see how it's moving from the left to the right or how it's moving from the right to the left. I hope that I'm not dabbling too much and that that actually makes sense to you guys. No, that, that makes perfect sense. And actually, I think that's, uh, you know, so as long as you've got your, you know, if you're on the left side, kind of like you were showing the XLI and the XLF, they were both moving in that northeast direction as opposed yes. to XLP, which was coming down. Yes. So that's, that's what you want to see. I mean, you want to see it gaining on both of your axes. Yes, we um, we actually have done a lot of research on uh, on the RRG heading, which is which is you know the move that we're in right now, um, and and it it looks like we're still going on that a strong RRG heading, which means if you compare it to a compass between zero and ninety degrees, is always good. No matter where you are on the RRG, a strong RRG heading is always good. Um, if you are far away inside lagging, like here, then it's it's good, but only for the short term because you will need just way too much relative power to move it all the way to leading. So you're you're probably trading a bounce within a relative downtrend, but it's still good, um, and that's where the um, where what I've been uh, calling here um, sectors that are inside weakening and turning back up without going to lagging saying that that is one of the strongest things that you can that you can see on an RRG. That stems from that type of research where we see that um, something that moves into a strong RRG heading is always good. Now, so when that happens inside the weakening quadrant, you, are, you have a sector or a stock at hand which is already in a relative uptrend, otherwise it would never be on the right side of the chart. It went through some sort of a setback and then moves back up again. So... Um, if we if we would quickly look at those yellow ones here, like real estate, discretionary, and technology, they're all inside weakening. But if they move up and they're they're all their their angle is not too weak and they're still away from 100, so you could you could see this technology to curl back up and move into leading. Uh, I mean, there is no certainty, but that's why I want to you know, monitor this rotation on the RRG for this to happen. And when that happens, then I'm fairly confident that it's a strong move. So I'll, I'll definitely be looking at these three sectors while they're inside weakening, waiting for the moment when they start uh, or they turn into a positive heading. Okay. Follow-up question for you. Yeah. We've got a number of folks who like to trade ETFs that watch the show. 
Yes. And say you've been in XLK and XLY for quite a while, and it's still, you know, over on the right hand side of the chart. You are expecting yeah. maybe to turn back up to leading. But yeah. let's say you've been overweight those two sectors and underweight the financials and industrials because they've been over in the lagging area. Would mm -hmm. you begin to move some of that money from XLK and XLY into XLF and XLI at this point? Or do you need some more confirmation? Um, this comes down to how aggressive you are. If you are, if you are a very aggressive trader and you, you like to trade like a little bit shorter term, I mean, the long-term trend is clearly in favor of, let's say, XLK and, and XLY here and, and XLRE as well uh, over financials and industrials over on the left-hand side. If you don't mind a shorter term trade, then, you know, looking for situations, let me just make them all visible here. Talks a little bit easier. Um, then, you know, say moving some money out of discretionary, out of technology into industrials and into financials is a very aggressive, but potentially very rewarding trade. But you got to be prepared to, to move the other way when financials and industrials turn this way and technology and discretionary move the other way. So um, I cannot look, it, it, it totally depends on someone's risk appetite, I'd say. I mean, it's, it's, you can definitely use, I know people who look for pair trades, uh, pretty much looking for stuff inside the leading quadrant that rolls over and inside the lagging quadrant that rolls up. Uh, but these people have a very um, strict money management program. They have very strict money management rules, very strict stops that they hold, and they trade the spread between the two, so they don't mind about the direction of the market. They are only interested in the in the in these two things moving relatively opposite. Um, and and then so yes, you can definitely do that if you if you're a little bit more uh, risk averse or you like stuff to be more certain than stuff that I'm looking for, for example, would be the healthcare against the energy move. Um, you know, so healthcare way inside leading, actually going into um, into the lagging quadrant. And then because this is not this fine so we move there. So you, you would you would look for you know, your XLV is now over here and XLE is over there. They're moving. So you're looking for those scissor moves, basically. So where they're moving in opposite directions um, and then, you know, following through. So that's where my trade, which is now, which now seems to be uh, rolling over was uh, staples versus um, energy. Let me fit this or max this out, which was a couple of weeks ago where you had a situation where staples started to pick up and energy starting to roll over, uh, which for me, both on the outsides of the RRG, was a, was a fantastic uh, setup. Um, so moving all the way there, and now you see that XLE is actually following through with that move, moving deeper into uh, lagging and, and losing relative strength, while XLP has rolled over. So I, you know, this probably now has to end because XLP is not doing any more what it wants. But the trade itself is still good because energy is still on the left of um, of staples. But that's how I look at it. Excellent. I mean, this is a, this discussion could go on for a long time. I yes, mean, it could. It's... Yeah, if we if we start moving this to daily charts, then we'll have another hour. <laughs> well, it's fascinating, and I know from all the comments that we get from the show, everyone is fascinated watching this. I think it's a great visual way to see what's going on in the market without looking at the charts and the numbers and the price action, everything else, just being able to watch the rotation there around the benchmark spider. Uh, I think it's fantastic. I think that this is just uh, an amazing set of uh, charts. Yeah, let me, let me emphasize that this is not a standalone tool. This is why I always split my screen when I talk on Market Watchers Live, because I want people to, um, to use RRGs for the big picture and then bring it to a regular chart. And, you know, my, my workflow is using relative strength. So I pretty much always have the raw relative strength line and the RRG lines on the chart. But if you're looking for, I don't know, overball of a soldier using RSI or stochastics or DPO or PPOs or whatever there is, maybe you're an Elliott Wave analyst. Doesn't really matter. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. But the RRG will give you the big picture. And you can benefit with that big picture to put whatever you're looking uh, on in this case on the right hand side of the screen 
into the bigger frame. So you're you're not um, you know funneled into in this case just the healthcare chart, but you can position healthcare inside the universe and and see how it interacts with the rest of the universe. And that is for me the biggest advantage of an RRG. It gives you that whole big picture and and position. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and bring the poll up. And while we do, I just want to make one more comment um, about what you just said, because to me, when I look at that rotation and I see the financials beginning to strengthen, I also look at the chart and I see the financials yesterday closed. The XLF closed at its highest level since back in mid-March. So you're seeing it on the chart in terms of absolute price action. And you're also seeing it in terms of the rotation as money rotates toward the group. So if financial, it, well, if interest rates keep moving higher, that should really bode well for the financials into the fourth quarter, I think. Yeah, and that is not a small sector. No, it is not. And so here you go. What sector do you expect to outperform in the next three months? Look at this. Yeah, now this is scary. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like sentiment, right, Julius? Yes, yeah, you gotta be careful with this. I mean, uh, anyway, I mean, yeah, but I agree. I mean, I, I, I would have um, healthcare and financials as the, uh, as the top two for myself. Well, XLK is not on here. We probably would have gotten a lot of technology fans. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was only allowed six. So uh, I thought, you know, technology is, is in the weakening quadrant. Let's go for stuff that's moving at a positive RG heading. But you're right. Maybe, maybe you're right. Well, we, we talk so much about technology. That's fine. But let's keep them yeah. technology out of the poll. <laughs> exactly. So, all right. Well, I know we got, uh, we're going to play some catch up here with the 10 in 10. And then Julius is going to stick around with us and uh, he's going to join us or the anatomy of a trade and talk a little bit about how he approaches the market. I think you'll find that very interesting. Let's yep. 10 in 10. I will, I will go and answer some questions in the chat box. Uh, meanwhile, sounds good. Perfect. All right. I've already got the RRG here ready. Um, I'm not going to, I'm going to pay more attention down here just to look at the sectors uh, that were requested since we're running low on time. Uh, remember yesterday, Tom, we had very few technology requests, and now we've got uh, quite a bit more, and financials seem to also be of interest. I always find it interesting to find, uh, you know, industrials and or materials uh, poking their heads in here, because generally we don't see a whole lot of those requested. So very interesting. So let's go ahead and get started with Bank of America. Uh, currently, Let's see, there is a tie in the chat room between OKTA and Pan W. So you guys get in there and like which one you want and we'll see what we can do. Okay, on Bank of America here, I see a couple of descending triangle patterns, which typically are, are bearish. I mean, these are, they, they're expected to resolve to the downside, although I tend to pay more attention to them off of downtrends because they are bearish patterns, they're bearish continuation patterns. So when you see one off of an uptrend like this, you can see we had a breakdown. It should have uh, generated much more selling, but didn't. And part of the reason is we're in a bull market. We're not in a bear market. But here we had a false breakdown and immediately went in another uptrend. And now here we are in another uh, descending uh, uh, bearish pattern here, descending triangle. And yet we've broken out. Look at the volume come in. So I think the key here is that you're in a bull market. And when you start looking for bearish patterns to execute, um, you're not going to be as, as successful in a uh, bull market as you would be in a bear market. So I like the banks. I like the financials. I think the 10-year treasury yield, yield goes higher. So I think this breakout to the upside is pretty significant. I like Bank of America. All right. And it looks like the winner is Pan W for the most popular in the chat room. So Palo Alto, it is. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, beautiful move up, breakout. This is uh, textbook action here, technically speaking, because here you've got your breakout. Um, you can see the volume picked up on the breakout after months of consolidation. Look where we went down to the rising 20 day moving average and price support took back off again, coming back down again, holding the 20 day moving average. I think it still looks good. The key level for me on the stock going forward is going to be 220. That's key price support now and the 50 day moving average. Okay. All right. The next one I have is, let's see, BLDP, Ballard Power Systems, Renewable Energy Space. 
Okay, well, definitely strengthening. It looks to me like we got a little change in character taking place here. And anytime I see a change in character in terms of price action, I really like to see the, uh, the follow through in terms of volume. And we're definitely getting that. Now, here's a stock that's just gone crazy in the near term. So you got to be careful. Um, let me uh, annotate this price support line. Check out, though, after we gapped up on the very heavy volume and we moved up to $4, look where we came back down to, right to this price support area before taking back off. And we broke out again around the 390 area. I think if we get a pullback, we could see 390. I like the stock. I like this change of character, but it's overbought. It's too stretched. I can't manage my risk jumping in here. So I'm, I would sit back and wait for uh, some selling. All right. The next one was uh, OKTA. Uh, Okta, Okta, what is it? <laughs> yeah, OKTA Inc. This is a software company. Uh, been a great performer for a long time. Software continues to be very strong. This is on my strong earnings chart list. I like the stock a lot. Beautiful volume here, over 10 million shares with the earnings when we got a massive gap up. Strong action. We've pulled back, and you can see the overbought conditions unwinding a little bit. I would prefer it at the 20-day moving average, maybe a little bit more weakness down closer to, say, 66 but otherwise, I think the stock goes higher. Okay. The next one from Clothing and Accessories, Funko, F-N-K-O. Yeah, I'm actually thinking about, I've been watching this stock, and I'm a, I, I like the hammer and that reversal that came in two days ago. So um, what, I'm, what I'm referring to here is this move right here. So you can see that reversal and the volume picked up. That was the biggest up volume the biggest volume on an up day that we had seen really since back in july so i think buyers resumed at that point and that means that i would be watching the low of that day as key support now going forward and that actually was the breakout level too um let me get rid of that one you can see this breakout above this prior high we came down tested it we've tested it twice now um, we do have a left shoulder over here this could be a right shoulder if the volume picks up and you lose 18 dollars, i'd be careful Otherwise, I think this is a reasonable setup for a, uh, for a more sub a sustainable uh, bounce, maybe coming in the short term. But 18 and a half to 19 would be uh, probably where you can best manage your risk. Okay. The next one is from the financial space. It looks pretty overbought, but, you know, we like that space. Uh, American Express, AXP. Yeah, AXP made a beautiful breakout back here in August about a month ago, and it's continued moving higher. So that uh, anytime you make a breakout above a prior high, that provides pretty good support. You can see we made the breakout. Stock ran up to almost 108, pulled all the way back, hit the 20-day, and almost hit price support here before this last rally. I don't like chasing, so I'm not a big fan here. But you did have a double, double or triple top breakout around 107, 107 and a quarter. And that's right where your 20-day moving average is. So that's what I would look for. Pullback on American Express, I think, is viable. Okay. The next one is an ETF, uh, the Vietnam ETF, VNM. Sort of an interesting setup there, but doesn't seem to be able to get above that overhead resistance. Yeah, again, I think you're talking about relative weakness. Uh, the key here, I think, is just taking a look at the... Um, the, the change from where this ETF was back in April to where it is now. Um, you know, you take a look at what the S&P has been doing. So if you get into this, you just have to understand you're in an area that has been completely underperforming for quite some time. It's challenging trying to get up off of this reaction high uh, resistance. So let's just draw that line in there. And you can see the 17 area is going to be a pretty important area to try to get back through. That also lined up with some overhead resistance here support here, gap uh, resistance here, gap resistance here. I mean, 17 is a pretty big number. So let's see if we can get through there. But again, the underperformance would chase me away. I wouldn't be interested. Okay. Let's try a pharmaceutical company, Merck, M-R-K. Yeah, pharmas have done very well. I was looking over the last three months, and it's one of the best performing industry groups. The only negative I see here on Merck is the negative divergence that's in play. I mean, it's in a great uptrend. And the divergence is simply moving higher in price, which we have right here, and having a lower uh, momentum oscillator, in this case, the PPO. So I, th I just think that's the problem, if there is one. So anytime I get this, now it doesn't guarantee us that we're going lower, 
but I would watch the breakout level. If we fail to hold this breakout level with a negative divergence, I'd be thinking maybe a test of the recent low and the rising 50 day moving average. So if we go below say 69 and a half, I'd be looking for maybe 67 and a quarter as re-entry. All right, curious what you have to say about this one. I, I like it a lot. It came up also on the RRG going the proper Northeast direction. Uh, and relatively on your relative chart, NOA, North American Construction Group. Um, yeah, I mean, I like it. Look at the volume coming in. The only negative for me is that outside of the last six, seven weeks, we haven't had much volume on the stock looking back. So it's just a, whether or not you trust the liquidity on the stock. Other than that, I agree. I think this is a nice looking stock. There was your most recent breakout. You can see the volume pouring in on that breakout. We went up a little higher the next day, came back down, look where we held on support, $8.30. And that's also your rising 20 day. So I like it. The only problem I don't, or the only thing I don't like is that outside of this recent uh, you know, few weeks, the volume concerns me a little bit on the stock. So I would probably avoid it because of that. But as an individual trader, um, you can probably still trade. I mean, it trades enough volume where you can, you can get out. I just prefer a little bit more volume, that's all. All right, and our final one, Tech Resources, T-E-C-K. I think that double bottom looks really interesting and relatively it looks like it's doing great. Yeah, it's definitely improving. Uh, it's another one that had been downtrending for a while. I'm gonna go back a little further here. I'm gonna actually go back two years and just see if this, well, this gives it a little bit better of a flavor because you can see that made a, a significant uh, move to the upside and has been downtrending throughout 2018. Um, and it does have some key areas that I would be watching. And the first one is going to be a possible neckline that could go in at the most recent reaction high. So here, alpha of a triple top, we come down. This could be an inverse left shoulder, the uh, neckline, inverse head, and we could be making our way back up now to that. Uh, I would be looking maybe for a pullback. Rising 20-day moving average would be uh, my possible entry point. All right. Excellent. That is 10 stocks in a very quick amount of time. <laughs> yes. All right, let's go ahead and look at the ones that we did. I will have these up in the Market Watchers Live chart list after the show. I do that now right away. Just go to the blogs tab and click on the Market Watchers Live blog and you'll see the link right there at the top. All right, time for our final market update. Let's see what has been going on while we have been talking RRG. All right. Let's see here. Okay. Make sure I have all of them updated here. Let's go ahead and look. Uh, Dow and, well, pretty much the markets are all uh, moving higher. Currently seeing new intraday highs on the Dow and the S&P 500 continuing higher. NASDAQ, you know, made a nice big move uh, on a gap in the open, but it has been moving mostly sideways, uh, hanging out right about at its intraday high. Currently, it's up uh, 79.84. Uh, OEX, S&P 100, looking about the same as the S&P 500, gap up, continuing higher. Look at mid caps. Had a little bit of uh, choppy trading here earlier in the morning, but it's now taking off. Uh, it is now uh, outperforming yesterday's high. We could see Russell 2000 small caps also reaching above yesterday's high. And we've got uh, the TSX uh, doing quite well. A little bumpy action today with a big gap up, a test of yesterday's close. And now right back up, looks like a small flag forming here. Treasury yields are lower today currently reading 3.066, so still over 3%. UUP big gap down, tried to make up some of those uh, losses, but it's heading right back down toward those intraday lows. Gold, GD, GLD, is currently at 114.13, up slightly uh, from yesterday, looking pretty good. Uh, looks like it took back some gains from the morning, but it is making its way back up toward intraday highs. TLT, on the rise today, but pulling back now just slightly off of the intraday high. USO oil opened higher, but is uh, trading lower, but mostly sideways. So we're looking at a six cents decline on USO. And that completes our 
final market update. Tom, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, technology I mentioned earlier, um, I think maybe Consumer Staples just passed it, leading today's action, but technology having a really nice day. And I know earlier software was leading technology, but it's now been uh, overtaken by a couple of different groups, including Internet. And uh, as you look at the Internet stocks, I am not a fan of this group. I think this part of technology is broken right now. Uh, but we have come up the last two days, did put in that double bottom, and now we've got some overhead resistance to deal with at the 20-day moving average, which is right at about that 1,700 level. And then look at all these support levels that failed back in early September as the volume increased. So I think 1,700 to about 1,720 is going to be a telling story on the internet stocks. Obviously, from a bullish perspective, we'd love for as many areas of the market to be bullish as possible. Wide participation is what you look for in terms of determining the sustainability of a bull market. But this is a group that I would be hesitant to jump into until I start to see better technical action. The bounce is nice, but it's got a lot of work to do. So with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to the anatomy of a trade. And uh, Julius has graciously decided to remain with us. And uh, he's going to share maybe a little bit of his trading style and strategy and I don't know. What do you have for us, Julius? Do you have a past trade or do you maybe a current trade? You yeah, I let me first. Um, let me grab the screen. Um, I am. I have to admit that I'm not really a trader in the sense as as I knew, you know, and everybody knows that you're a really short term and very active trader. Uh, people may know by now that I look more at the bigger picture. I'm, so I'm, um, you know, looking at bigger rotations, bigger moves. Um, you know, I can I can be perfectly fine not looking at the market during the day and just, you know, at the end see, okay, what happened today? I'm looking at the bigger picture, uh, even at the weekly close. Um, but that's not really trading. And as we have um, uh, just talked about the turtle soup setups, which is, if I was going to trade very actively, this would be the type of setups that I would be looking for. And I would I, I would be looking to uh, probably combine them with the trend following aspect of RRG relative strength and the uh, reversal aspects of the turtle soup strategy. So I'd be looking for, you know, in an ideal world, I'd be looking for turtle soup setups of securities that are, let's say, either inside the lagging quadrant uh, and turning up or inside the weakening quadrant and turning up. Now, I've quickly, very quickly, while you were talking, uh, browsed through a number of the setups that came out of the scan. Uh, unfortunately, there is none that is turning up right now. So from, a, from an RRG point of view, they're all pretty negative. Um, but in terms of how I would work that trade, um, let me see. This is AWK. The one that I thought was looking pretty good was MAC, was MAC. Um, which, and the reason why I would like this one is because it is at a level where we've seen price action before. We've seen lows you know, here around 55.20, 55.30, 55.60, 68. And now today we dropped to 55.45. The previous 20-day low was 55.64, this one. Um, so we entered, if we would have followed the rules of the turtle soup setup, um, let's say roughly around 55.80, 55.90 maybe. So just when it bounced back up here. Now, I would probably then move, because it's a daily setup, but to manage this trade, I would move to a intraday chart. Um, probably, I, I'd like to give it a little bit of leeway. So um, let's see, maybe 15 minutes. Um, and then, you know, the original um, stop level is just below the low. So the stop would be 55.40. Um, we have seen a higher low already on this. So I probably would have moved my stop now to this 55.99. So let's, let's make that 55.95. Um, so if it goes below 55.95, 
Terviet, so it'll be almost break even, small profit. Um, but if I look at this setup intraday, then I really think if this strength in the market can pull through and we can go beyond 56.40, 56.45, we could go work our way slowly higher to, you know, what's this, 56.70, maybe even 57, uh, the figure, uh, which would be a very decent trade for, for a short-term trade. So um, entry point somewhere here. Initial stop, 55.42, moved up right now to, let's say, 56, 55.90. That's still where it's resting right now. Um, and as I'm swing trading, I'd probably be looking to, uh, to exit the trade before the close, no matter what, because I'm just short-term trading right now. Okay. Sounds good. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. I got two for you, and actually just got them uh, today. <laughs> so this is anatomy of a current trade and what I'm doing right now. So I actually looked at both of these yesterday. I think uh, that was part of our final segment uh, yesterday, which I think was, uh, let's see, are you buying this? Yes. And I don't remember if you agreed with both of them, but I'm, I'm in, <laughs> Tom. So let's take a quick peek. So the first one is Assurant. Uh, incorporated and this is in the insurance space so I'm pretty happy about that I got the PMO buy signal it was on the radar it had just made that uh, buy signal I think yesterday or the day before uh, so I went ahead and got in I'm at, I got in at 106.19 so it was already in the middle of this move uh, to the upside so I kind of ended up uh, on the on the loss on the on the purchase uh, for now but that's okay I'm, I'm feeling good about this one I've got Look at right here, the 520 and 50 day EMAs all went into a buy signal at the same time. So I'm pretty pleased with it uh, on the way into the hot zone for the scooter. I decided to do the, since I'm gonna make this more of an intermediate term trade, uh, I went ahead and used the one and a half ATRs uh, as my stop. So it is very low stop, but this is more of an intermediate term trade. The, the one and a half ATR, um, is really set up so that you don't get stopped out at the one average true range. Uh, and Dr. Elder is the one who sort of was the proponent of this at ChartCon. It was one of the, the main things I took away from it because he told me that setting stops at obvious areas of support and resistance is not always the best thing. Uh, you can get stopped out by all the wolves uh, who come and grab your stock when you're selling it. and uh, because it's dipped down just below its average true range, or it's dipped down right at a, a, an area of support or resistance. So uh, while it may look like the reward, reward risk isn't that great here, uh, again, it's more of an intermediate term trade. I'm expecting it to go uh, certainly above that all time high. I looked at the weekly chart as well. Uh, the PMO is trying to make a little bit of an upside move above the signal line you can see it's far from being overbought here far from being overbought and you know we got that bounce off of some pretty important uh, support back here from 2017 we busted ahead of this particular area of overhead resistance at about 105 or just below so i thought this one looked like a good trade uh, the other one i'm uh, looking at that i purchased today was rig and like i said at the top of the show uh, you know, I looked at this one yesterday also in the are you buying this segment, and I really liked the chart. Uh, I studied it a bit more uh, last night, today, and after the open, I was sad to have missed uh, a big move here, but I did get in at 1271, so I am on the upside by three cents right now, which isn't horrible. Uh, my stop, again, I set uh, this one I set, I'm going to probably fix that because I'm going to set it uh, using that. ATR, uh, one and a half ATRs. And again, that'll put me all the way down to $11.07 on this as far as a stop. But again, I'm looking for a very big move here. I'm looking for the height of this pattern to the upside. That's a $2 move. Uh, so I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about hitting the 1450 range here uh, on this as a short term trade. But I think on an intermediate term trade, it looks pretty good as well. Uh, you can see right here, the PMO is just now turned up. 
Uh, it's broken out from this declining tops trend line here on the weekly chart. Uh, there's certainly more room past what we're seeing on that daily chart for it to move higher. So, you know, honestly, I'm looking up here at that 1750 level. So for an intermediate term trade, and I think somebody, OJ, uh, in, the, in the chat room actually said uh, they, he wants to see more discussion on longer term entries and exits. Well, here you go. Uh, that's where I'm at right now. And I'm using the elder uh, system of a one and a half ATR stop. So those were my two. Um, what, do you, what do you have for us, Tom? Oh, I've got I'm sure you have about 20, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I got a little nervous um, with the market recently. Uh, unfortunately, bad timing there. But um, yeah, the overall um, uh, stock market, I kind of like I'm trying to get my charts up right now before I bring the screen over. And right now it is not wanting to do it. Um, try and no, nope, it's not doing it. Can you do me a favor? Can you just pull the charts up? I certainly can. All right, the first one, if you can pull up my style, that'd be great. If not, no, no worries. Uh, the first one is Tilly's, T-L-Y-S. I'll tell you what, I can do your uh, relative. Whoa, what happened there? Yeah, I'm wondering, I just had the same message for Safari, so I'm not quite sure what's going on there. All right, well, let's uh, go over here. Let's try this one. Yep, and which one was it again? T-L-Y-S. T-L-Y-S, Tilly's, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, so this one's uh, return back to gap support. So this is kind of, in a nutshell, what I really like to do in the market. I, I don't like chasing the move like we saw at the end of August and early September, where the stock ran from 18 to 25 on its earnings report. Um, instead, yeah, it's going to be, yeah, it's a little tight, but you can kind of see the upper right-hand corner. It's pulled back into that gap support area around 18. So I'm actually in this one. Um, I've been building a position, and I'm looking for a resumption back up to where we were um, on those earlier highs. I think the stock goes back to 25, but uh, we'll see if we close back below 18, certainly below the 50 day moving average, I would be out of the stock. So I can keep my stop fairly tight. And uh, if it does resume back to the upside, then I would be fine. I think even further back, you probably could go back and, co and uh, connect a trend line from those recent lows. And I think the stock sets up pretty nicely for that. Okay. Um, Oh, you're gonna, like yeah, you don't need to annotate. That's all right. Let's just move on to the next one, which is uh, Splunk, S-P-L-K. Right. I actually just got into this one today, and it is right at the, the top of gap support. That 115 area, area, you can see down below the volume, over 10 million shares. The stock gapped up that day at 115, traded over 10 million shares that day, went from 115 up to almost 125 on the close. Kept rising, got up to 130. I don't like to chase that those moves, but now we've come all the way back down to the scene of the crime, right at 115, and I can keep a fairly tight stop. Now, if it breaks below this level on a closing basis, then we could definitely see the bottom fill down to 107.50. My style is not to hold unless that was part of my entry strategy to begin with, which it it was not. So I'm watching this one very closely, and then uh, let's do another one. Uh, ZUO. This is another software, by the way. ZUO. Uh, I love the candle that's going in today. I actually bought this one today as well. But you can see it is testing the late July low. Came right down, went a little bit below it on an intraday basis, and is now back up near the high of the day, and the volume is picking up. I think this one could make a run. It actually gapped lower at the end of August with uh, earnings. But the earnings beat. We beat on top line, beat on bottom line. But a lot of it was priced in with that run-up that we saw in August. So with the gap down, I just watched and waited, had it on my strong earnings chart list. And I was just waiting for the support area to be tested. We went below it. And now it looks like we're trying to reverse. And the beauty of this is that I can put my stop in below today's low. So I will have an intraday stop, and I don't have it right now. But there will be an intraday stop in below today's low of 2180. And then the last one I wanted to do was, uh, this is a defense stock, AJRD. Okay. Uh, defense was really, had, had really picked up recently. It pulled back the last couple of days. And AJRD went down after the huge run-up with earnings in late July and early August. The, the pullbacks went back to about 33 and a half back in early August. Um, but that low around 33 and a half was breached today. It went down below 33, and what I'm looking for is a reversal. 
and a move back up. Today's low will be my stop on this one as well. I'm looking for a reversal off of the low from earlier today. So I could get stopped out very quickly, but I would be looking for these stocks to return to recent highs. All right. So let's go ahead and pull up the summary. And then we're going to do one last special treat with Julius and the RRG since we have him with us. But there is your summary of the anatomy of a trade, some of the stocks that we each talked about and covered. And now, Julius, if you can take the screen, I would love for you to bring up a an RRG on the financial group, because that is a group that we each, I think everyone kind of agrees that we're starting to see some love in that group. Yes. And so what are you seeing in terms of some of these sector or industry groups within the financials? Yeah, um, it's on the screen right now. Um, actually, this is a pretty clear cut picture which favors the uh, reinsurance index, which is DJUSIU, almost crossing over into leading, followed by, I'd say, banks and life insurance. What you definitely do not want to be in is the asset managers, and the financial administration is doubtful. Um, the, the tail here is very short, so it's stable. It's pretty good, but it's not. It's probably had a run already. If this starts to move higher, then yes, I'd be back into it for right now. I would say, um, you know, the reinsurance stuff looks very, very good. So I'd, I'd be looking for a couple of names in that industry group. Okay. Now, what's really interesting here, Joyce, is that you're comparing it to the S&P. And, of course, financial. Ah. Not really been a very good performer. How about change? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that's, that's your sharp man. There you go. Same picture, different setup. Uh, the, the, the rotations didn't change, just the benchmark changed. So you see that the a um, little bit higher here is your um, reinsurance uh, is against the financials already inside leading. So very strong there. Um, banks very close to it. Financial administration, losing strength, still strong. Um, and the asset managers are still the weakest in this sector. Okay. Good call, Tom. Well, nice. I'm, well, and I'm also looking at that life insurance because one of the stocks that uh, Aaron just mentioned was the Assurant, a yep. AIZ, which is in that space. Um, it's kind of a confusing little tale there. What, what's going on with the deep SIL? And we have about 30 um, Yeah, this is, this is just, there is no power. If you look at a tail like this, there is power behind the move. This is going into a direction. This is sort of undecisive, just like banks, sort of undecisive. This is negative power. This is negative power, strong power, and the banks and the, um, what's that, life insurance, mm -hmm. um, not much of a signal there, I'd say. Okay, because when you look at a chart, now we don't really have time, but the, the life insurance group just broke out. Yeah, you can see it right there with that little thumbnail um, or the little mini mini chart. But we are getting a breakout above 810. And this is a group that was really strong with the rise in interest rates in 2016 and 2017. So if we get a breakout, I could see this group doing well. And that's why I was curious how it would show up on the RR. Yeah, I can see it on price. But on the relative, as you can see, it needs a little bit of work. Um, could be a very small double bottom on the relative line, but it needs a little bit of work. But I, I agree with you. But what you will see on the, uh, on the RRG is that this will then start to jump away. And when you see it moving away from this short tail lengthening, that's when you want to get interested. Okay, awesome. Joyous, always a pleasure having you on the show. This was fascinating as usual. Look forward to having you back again soon, my friend. No problem. That was great. Thank you so much. And I love that split screen. I think everybody learns a lot about RRG just by seeing that. No doubt. Here is our upcoming schedule. Uh, I do have a workshop on Tuesday. I'll let you know at some point what I'm going to do. I'll come up with something. Um, but we do have Tom McClellan joining us next week in addition to Mary Ellen tomorrow. So a lot of good stuff coming up. I want to thank everybody for being with us today. Please remember to complete that survey as you exit. We do love to get your feedback, hear what you think of Market Watchers Live. Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Happy trading.
Here's how to put a simple line on your chart without using the annotation tool. Let's say we want a line in here at 4750. You can just drop down here into the overlays, pick horizontal line, add the price point 47.5 and we're going to use a red line. We're going to make it solid and thick and hit update and that blasts it into the middle of your chart.